You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org, Medscape Cardiology. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape. You can now access the latest in medical news on your Amazon Alexa-enabled device. Join me, Perry Wilson, every weekday morning for Medscape Medical Minute, where I highlight the top medical stories of the day. To add Medscape Medical Minute to your flash briefing, search for Medscape Medical Minute on Amazon and click Enable. Or open the Amazon Alexa app, go to Skills, search for Medscape Medical Minute, and click Enable. Then say, Alexa, what's the news? Or, Alexa, what's my flash briefing? I hope you'll join us. Hi, everyone. This is John Mandrola from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology. And this is This Week in Cardiology for September 22nd, 2023. This week... More on coronary artery calcium scans, cardiac arrest survival, good news in factor 11 drug development, advanced practice clinicians, and a movement towards a new board certification in cardiology. The first topic today is coronary artery calcium. Jack Interventions has published an observational cohort study looking at the rate of atherosclerotic cardiac events in a group of patients referred for coronary CT scans. Now, they retrospectively made two groups, those with established CAD or vascular disease, such as a prior MI stroke or PAD, peripheral artery disease, and the second group were those without atherosclerotic events. Think of it as a secondary and primary prevention groups. Now, all these patients had coronary artery calcium scores derived from the CTA scans. In the primary prevention group, they broke down coronary artery calcium into four groups, CAC of 0, 1 to 99, 100 to 299, and then in greater than 300. They then looked at the rate of future events. The main finding was that patients with a CAC greater than 300 had the same rate of events as those with established atherosclerotic vascular disease. In other words, In primary prevention, if you have a super high coronary artery calcium score, you should be treated as those who had prior events. They concluded, quote, this observation that those with coronary artery calcium greater than 300 have event rates comparable to those with established vascular disease supplies important background for further study related to secondary prevention treatment targets in subjects without prior vascular disease but have elevated coronary calcium. Quote, understanding the CAC scores that are associated with atherosclerotic risk equivalents to stable secondary prevention populations may be important for guiding the intensity of preventive approaches more broadly. Okay, my comments. It's also pretty neat and easy, isn't it? It Makes total sense. Perhaps the hidden message here is that a certain score means you have coronary artery disease and should be treated as such. But I'm not convinced by this paper. Now, let me start first with the author's words. They write, quote, It must be emphasized that as an observational prospective study, we did not have complete information on treatment and other clinical indicators of risk, which limits our conclusions. They also made a second statement that I think re- ought to be highlighted. Quote, Furthermore, Because this was a referred population for coronary CTA across many indications, caution must be taken when generalizing to the general population. All right, that's important. I would also point out that the authors don't report the 10-year risks of the coronary calcium group as calculated from like a PCE, pooled cohort equation. Now, I just eyeballed the baseline characteristics of the CAC greater than 300 group They had more hypertension, more smoking, and higher cholesterol than the lower coronary artery calcium groups. So they might also have had a higher PCE score, and that could be used to maximize therapy. Another curious thing is the study's population. Now, these were pretty low risk of events in those with established disease. In the first year, patients in the established CAD arm had a major adverse event rate of 3 to 4%. Now, contrast this with the CURE study of clopidogrel aspirin versus aspirin alone after myocardial infarction. MACE in these patients were 9 to 11% in the first year. 
So my take, therefore, is that these are not super high-risk established coronary artery disease patients in this registry. Also, I have this sort of general problem with the whole idea of declaring a patient to have CAD. I mean, rather than just being at risk for CAD. Here's why. Guidelines say if you have established disease, you are eligible for additional LDL-lowering drugs beyond high-intensity statins, such as PCSK9 inhibitors or azetamide. Now, on paper, that looks great, as in coronary calcium greater than 300 patients can take extra drugs. But I'd say go back and look at those trials of the PCSK9 and azetamide. I mean, neither of these drugs reduce mortality or CV mortality. They both provide small absolute risk reductions in non-fatal events. And these are really small changes. Um, so I'm not sure how much of a big advantage that is. I want to finish this session by repeating my warning about coronary artery calcium scans. These scans are, in the best case, minimally uh, useful for risk stratification. I'm not sure they're much better than the pooled cohort equation. They have never been shown to reduce outcomes in a proper outcomes trial. And in real life, coronary artery calcium scans scare patients and they are a major driver of angiography, PCI, and bypass surgery of asymptomatic disease. I mean, this is so common for a person to get revascularization based on a CAC score that it's really no longer noteworthy. No one even calls me anymore to tell me about it because it happens so often. And I've had octogenarians in my clinic ask me to order CAC scans. I have patients whose arrhythmia is causing them so many problems. It's a major problem, but they're more worried about their coronary artery calcium score, even though they're already on high-dose statins. Now, CAC proponents say, shut up, Mandrola. None of us ever wrote that coronary artery calcium scans should be used in this way to drive angiography or PCI. And I agree that the proponents have never said that, but they have done little to stop the misuse of these tests. I would propose to the coronary artery calcium proponents that they begin a massive public education program that really has, in capital letters, don't use CAC scans to drive downstream testing. It's really a terrible thing that's happened out there in this world with coronary artery calcium scans. My view is just simple, primary or secondary prevention alike. If a person wants to do everything to reduce heart disease risk, we tell them eat a great diet, exercise regularly, don't smoke, make sure your blood pressure is controlled, and take a high-dose statin, and don't ignore symptoms when they arise. Otherwise, stay away from medical imaging and overly enthusiastic doctors. Our second topic is cardiac arrest. Now, cardiac arrest was in the news this month. I'm a, I'm a fan of professional cycling. I'm a cyclist, a former bike racer, so I pay attention. Professional cyclist Nathan Van Hoydunk, who is an important teammate to cycling stars such as Wout Van Aert and Jonas Vinegal, was driving his car in Belgium when he had a cardiac arrest. Now, initial reports were that he had a car crash because apparently he went forward into an intersection and had a crash after the arrest. But it turned out that he required out-of-hospital resuscitation. He was then transferred to a hospital, and reports this week was that he had a cardiac condition requiring an internal defibrillator, and he has to retire from professional cycling. Now, Mr. Van Hoydunk benefited from the chain of survival of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And I want to go back to an RCT that was presented at the ESC meeting that directly studied part of this chain and is now a good time to review the ARREST trial, A-R-R-E-S-T, which was a prospective RCT randomizing non-STEMI patients who had return of spontaneous circulation at the scene and that the comparisons were between transferring these patients to a, quote, specialized cardiac arrest center or the geographically closest standard hospital. Now, the arrest trial was carried out in London. First author, Tiffany Patterson, PhD. And in London, I didn't know this, but I read that there are seven special cardiac arrest centers with emergency out of hours, provision for interventional cardiology, cardiac surgery, and specialist intensive care facilities. The primary outcome of the arrest trial was all-cause mortality at 30 days, and right off the bat, you love this study, don't you? You have a great unbiased endpoint, right? Alive or dead. This wasn't non-fatal MI or 
heart failure hospitalizations, or an anxiety or depression score. Also, I love the arrest study design because I can easily imagine a group of key opinion leaders saying how important it is to get these cardiac arrest survivors to our specialized hospital. We have, obviously, this is a good policy to get patients to specialized centers. Well, the arrest authors randomized about 400 patients to each group. One group went to the specialized centers. One group went to the closest hospital. The primary endpoint of 30-day mortality occurred in 63% of both groups. Identical risk ratio 1.00, conference interval 0.90 to 1.11. I think even Professor Frank Harrell uh, would have probably allowed me to say there was no difference, no benefit of these specialized centers. Now, my comments. The authors spent time in the discussion section saying how this data affects hospital planning and resource use. And of course, that is true. But I also think the resuscitation and ICU space can teach us a lot about the importance of RCTs, sort of the epistemiology of medicine. How do we know what works and doesn't work? Arrest trial says get survivors of cardiac arrest to the nearest hospital. Stop worrying about these specialized centers. Think about the ECLS trial. No benefit from VA ECMO and cardiogenic shock after MI. And how about the oodles of targeted temperature RCTs showing no benefit to aggressive cooling in survivors of cardiac arrest? And that was a massive reversal of practice. Resuscitation trials rarely bring the attention of drug or device trials, but gosh, they teach us a lot about how we should know things in medicine. I think if this podcast had to have another name, I think it would be When in Doubt, Randomize. Now, one final comment up on the heart.org Medscape Cardiology site right now is a nice conversation about cardiac arrest in famous athletes. Uh, Drs. Bob Harrington and Manesh Patel hit many of the important themes I agree with many of their comments, especially the caution they express in screening athletes. Now, my answer to improving survival in cardiac arrest is not from better screening, but more aggressive use of public health measures like those that save Damar Hamlin, uh, Christian Erickson, Bromley James, and now Nathan Van Hoydonk. I mean, consider that these athletes were almost certainly screened and still they had cardiac arrest. Therefore, I think the bottom line is that this survival cardiac arrest really depends on public health measures, public health measures that lead to better and faster out-of-hospital CPR and early defibrillation. All right, next topic is factor 11 inhibition. For the prevention of thrombotic events, first there were vitamin K antagonists like warfarin. Now we have direct acting oral anticoagulants that are other factor 10 inhibitors or direct thrombin inhibitors. Perhaps soon there will be factor 11 inhibitors. This week, the makers of a drug called Abel Asimab, an injectable monoclonal antibody factor 11 inhibitor, announced that a large phase 2 study called Azalea Timmy 71 study was halted this week because of a, quote, overwhelming reduction in the primary endpoint of major bleeding with the drug abelacimab versus rivaroxaban. Now, these were patients who had atrial fibrillation and at moderate to high risk for stroke. Before I go on, a few notes on factor 11 and its inhibition, then the study. Factor 11 is a special part of the coagulation cascade. It's involved in the amplification of clot formation, and the hope or promise of factor 11 inhibition is that it may allow for preservation of normal hemostatic function to a greater extent than DOACs. And a company slide proposes the uncoupling of two interlinked pathways, which A, suppress the pathologic thrombotic pathway, while leaving the physiologic hemostatic mechanisms largely intact. And I know, I know you've heard such amazing plausibility arguments before, like the suppression of PVCs after MI or hormone replacement therapy to reduce cardiovascular outcomes in postmenopausal women. So now we are in the RCT testing phase. And of course, DOACs are the standard of care. Azalea is an event-driven randomized study comparing two blinded doses of able asimab, 90 milligrams or 150 milligrams, given by subcutaneous injection once monthly, once monthly, versus rivaroxaban, 20 milligrams daily in about 2,000 patients with AFib. 
They say that the full results of the study is going to be presented at an upcoming scientific congress. Now, in a previous proof of concept study published in New England Journal back in 2021, a single dose of apel asimab achieved a large reduction in venous thromboembolism versus enoxaparin in patients undergoing knee surgery. So there is some data. My comments are that Azalea really generated a big buzz online. It was a dramatic press release, lots of attention on Twitter. And I think optimism here is warranted, but I'd say it's a cautious optimism. I mean, press releases give very little details. Phase two studies are for dose ranging and safety. Next, of course, we need phase three outcome trials against DOACs. At my hospital we're, and clinic, we're randomizing an oceanic AFib study of Sunduxian, which is an oral factor 11 inhibitor versus apixaban. Uh, what we need to know with this group of drugs is the net benefit. While there may be less bleeding, which is great, we also need to know, is there also less stroke prevention? And the only way to know that is with big phase three studies like oceanic AFib, and surely that is next for able asimab. Now, I'm not an expert in this space. I know that there will be also many factor 11 inhibitors. Able asimab is a monthly injectable, which may be nice for adherence, but may be less ideal for patients who uh, come to have procedures like colonoscopy or other kinds of surgeries. Yet, uh, then again, maybe the promise of uncoupling of clotting and bleeding will allow for uh, non-interruption of factor 11 inhibitors. I think there's a lot to know. I want to close this section, though, on a kind of general note, which is by noting how careful the drug development and regulation process is. I mean, they have phase two studies, then large powered outcome trials, and to me, this is the right way, right? I mean, we also keep in mind here, we have a serious confluence of interest between industry and clinicians and patients. The profit motive is incentivizing companies to make a better drug than the DOAX, which already are a good standard. Companies are competing, and, and, and these uh, competitions will be tested in proper randomized controlled trials. And to me, this is all the ideal uh, process of innovation. Now, I wish the cardiac device step space could be like this, this rigorous. While we can never randomize as many patients in device trials relative to drug trials, it just doesn't seem to me that we have the same rigor when we're testing devices. Think uh, about impella, left atrial appendage occlusion, and even something as simple as an ICD during gen changes. None of these have really been studied in large proper trials with outcomes. I think the device space could learn a lot from the drug development space, and if anybody knows why, the device regulatory process is so much more lax than drug development process. Please weigh in on the comments. Let me know. Okay, final topic is advanced practice clinicians. The BMJ has published a cross-sectional study from American authors looking at the proportion of healthcare visits delivered by nurse practitioners, PAs, and how this has changed over time and by clinic setting, diagnosis, and demographics. This was a survey study that went from 2013 to 2019, but keep that in mind because I think the trends are continuing the same direction from 2019 to now. The proportion of outpatient visits delivered by APCs increased from 14% to 25%, one in four. In 2019, the diagnosed it mattered if we were for APC care. For ophthalmology care, APCs saw 13%. For hypertension, 20%. For anxiety disorders, APCs saw 37%. And for respiratory diseases, APCs saw 41% of visits. And among all patients who had at least one visit, 42%, nearly half, had one or more APC visits. Okay, my comments. First, this is a good use of observational data. The authors don't tell us anything about outcomes with the two different kinds of care because they can, it would be marred by a tremendous amount of bias. Instead, they tell us what is actually happening. And what is happening is remarkable. I mean, having done this job for a while, 
I find it very remarkable. I would have never guessed this when I started training many years ago. And if I had to guess, the trends for APC-delivered care are only increasing and are probably even more in 2023 versus the end of this survey, which was in 2019. I also gather that this is an American issue only. Um, My friends in the UK are also talking about uh, the trends happening there. Now, I don't have a strong opinion about the rise of APCs, and the reason is because it doesn't matter. It is happening whether I have an opinion or not. And I've worked with advanced practice clinicians for decades, and some of them, those who have stayed in their specialty and have been committed to learning, are amazing. I trust their clinical judgment as much as any physician. I would have zero trouble being seen by such an APC. I've even written previously that on average, on average, APC delivered care will be equal to MD delivered care. And I think that is because the vast majority of medical problems do not require any special training. The problem, of course, and this is where great mentorship and focused attention of a clinician comes into play, are the unusual cases. If you are an unusual case, you hope that a bell goes off in the brain of the person who sees you. That person doesn't need to figure the problem out. They just need to know that something is up and they should phone a friend or suspend the usual algorithm. And that sense can be taught, right? It can be honed with experience. A degree, a background of years of studying the Krebs cycle doesn't matter. For instance, one outlier that we're seeing a lot of these days is normal glycemic ketoacidosis from SGLT2 inhibitors. It's being missed by lots of people with all different manners of letters after their name. And of course, we're doing education and letters are being sent to clinicians, emails are being sent, but here's the thing. You don't need a specific degree to not miss this problem. All you need to do is not ignore a major lab abnormality as in a low bicarb. I mean, these things come with big red rectangles and exclamation points on them. I think an APC could do this as well as any MD. So I guess the major take home I leave you with is that the rise of APC delivered care should make doctors think about our education and licensing. If advanced practice clinicians can do what many MDs can do with a fraction of the training, then maybe medical educators need to think about our current training programs. And I get the sense that a lot of how we were trained was based on a world before there was an internet or Google or smartphones. My opinion as a practicing clinician is that training needs to be more focused on taking care of patients, training clinicians to care for people. This is what we do. If it were me, I would focus less on Krebs cycle, basic science, climate change, and more on the study of evidence and the use of evidence in the care of people at the bedside. Now, I know this is a really controversial topic amongst clinicians and doctors specifically, so let me know what you think. You may disagree, and that's fine. Now, before I close, I want to just mention that there's been a major movement in board certification in the U.S. The ACC, American College of Cardiology, has announced that along with Sky and Heart Failure Society and HRS, they are considering forming a new board certification for cardiovascular medicine, one that moves away from the ABIM brand of maintenance of certification. This new board requirement they write will de-emphasize timed high-stakes performance exams and the continuous certification process and instead focus on learning assessments to identify gaps in current knowledge or skills with recommendations offered on CME learning resources and activities to help close the gaps. And my friends, this just happened um, and I have not had time to explore exactly what it means, so stay tuned. I'll cover it on future podcast, but you can put me down as a, as a bit cautious. So that's it for this week in cardiology. As always, I'm grateful that you listened. And remember, if you like this podcast, please take the time to give us a rating on whatever podcast app you use. And even a one or two sentence review, these things go a long way to help others find us. 
Until next week, this is John Mandrola from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology. You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape.